Hello and welcome to Frustrations in Enterprise Improvements. We would like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. I would like to first address a few logistical issues for the session and then I will introduce our presenter Rick Haynes. We have a lot of material that is planned for this one hour webinar so the audio will be muted for the remainder of the presentation to ensure that Rick is able to get through the entire presentation in the time that we've allowed. We will not be able to hear you, but please don't let that stop you from asking questions. You can do so in the text box through the GoToWebinar software. We value your questions, and if they are not answered during the presentation, they will be answered at the end or offline through phone or email after today's session. There will also be a recording of the webinar, which will be available on our website within 48 hours, and you will receive an email with instructions to access this recording. Please know that as a participant in this webinar, someone with Smarter Solutions will be giving you a call. If you do not want us to contact you, please let us know in the feedback survey at the end of the webinar. I will now introduce our speaker, who is Rick Haynes. As some of you may have seen, Forrest Breifogel is our CEO and founder. He was planning to present this session to you today, but due to other business needs, is out of the country. So Rick is going to be our presenter, and we are excited to have him. Rick is a 19-year Lean Six Sigma practitioner and one of Smarter Solutions senior instructors. Through his career, he has certified as Master Black Belt, Black Belt, champion and yellow belt, along with teaching and certifying professionals in all the Lean Six Sigma areas. His personal Lean Six Sigma work has spanned nearly all business types, including manufacturing, transactional, along with research and development business. He is a master degree statistician and has taught statistics in the Penn State University system. He has worked in all levels of the business from the entry level up to a site engineering manager. His life experiences and skills will provide you with an engaging discussion of the frustrations facing business today in the area of business improvement. I will now hand the presentation, presentation over to Rick and we will begin. Again, thanks for joining. I'm ready. Well, hello there. This webinar is called Frustrations in Enterprise Improvement. What are the expectations for this session? Well, I want to make sure we're all on about the same page of what we're going to get. What I'm going to talk about is illustrations of typical things that have not gone well in business. We're going to talk about problems with traditional business metrics and scorecards. And towards the end, we'll talk about firefighting. Firefighting in the sense that it's a huge resource drain on a business or even organization. And it can even lead to people losing jobs over it. So we're going to not only highlight fundamental problems with the current systems, but talk about some ways to get through it. First thing here, we have a question. We'll take polls through this. Get a general idea what you might be looking for in the attendance of this webinar. Please pick one. I'll give you a few seconds here, and then share the result. Looks like we're getting a good mix of things here. All right, a few more seconds. Should be closing it out right now. Let's see how it turned out. Good mix of people. Majority here just looking for personal improvement, which is a good thing. There's a lot of stuff in here that will help you maybe look at things different. Um, but it's going to support the things we're talking about here with scorecards and business problems. All right. And again, don't forget to type in questions along the way. We will try to address them as we go along. If not, we'll get in this. Mallory told us to start. We'll get back with you on it. Okay. Don't know if your business does it or not, or maybe you've seen it somewhere. But a lot of improvement programs have not stood the test of time. Many companies tried TQM or Total Quality Management. It lasted, did some good things, and went away. 
We dealt with a company that said they could claim $100 million in savings, but no one could really find the money. Another one that we've worked with here, they said they had saved more than a billion dollars in Lean Six Sigma savings, but they couldn't drive management interest in their program. What could we do to help? And while that time their stock prices went down, you see there's something wrong that you can claim that much savings and your management isn't engaged. A lot of companies we see to have stalled on their general Lean or Lean Six Sigma deployments where they previously hunted to find projects, now they're seeing benefits of a more systematic approach, which we're going to call IEEE, or Integrated Enterprise Excellence. Three focuses through this webinar. Metrics driving, driving the wrong behavior, scorecards that can lead to the wrong behavior, and unneeded firefighting. But we'll talk about wrong behavior as leading to behaviors or actions that are not to the benefit of the business itself at an overall enterprise level. Got another question here. <clears throat> Talk about what do you think about your business improvement program or organizational improvement program? What you guys are doing right now? Please take a few seconds and check one. See what the audience has right now. Are you getting a good good set of answers? A couple of them aren't chosen yet. All right, just a few seconds here, please, and fill them out. Okay, we're closing the poll. Let's see how everybody did. Well, it looks like we got a pretty good split between not being very systematic, and we're trained to use the Lean and Six Sigma stuff, but it's not top down. Both of those are very common. All right, we should be covering those as we walk through this webinar. Here's another example. I've got a major electronics company. This is about following metrics but leading to poor behavior at the enterprise level. The company had a goal to reduce staffing. They gave every department an equal goal, reduce your labor and therefore your overhead. Well, the IT manager looked at his stuff. He said, well, I need to reduce my overhead, my labor, so where can I reduce people? Well, I have people that support IT projects. Well, I have 15 different customer databases within the company. Well, if I can go to one, I'd need less people to support it. So the IT department stopped development of all other stuff throughout the entire company, took their entire development resources and put them on putting together one customer database that everybody would use. Well, they did get it done. And half the people liked it. The other half didn't want it, kept their old database. It also disrupted the entire company's development works for anything that had IT-based improvements involved. The question was the metric good to reduce staffing. Well, that's a good goal. How they went about it for the local impact on the IT department was a reasonable way, but look what it did to the entire system. Many of us have experienced these local improvements which are net losses to the entire system. Do you think in this case, this example, that the business thought this was a good thing for the IT department to do? Probably not. Let's go to another one here. Outside of the typical manufacturing, how about the service industry? Fast food sales. Business sold fried chicken. They said, we need to get our chicken efficiency up, and we've all dealt with efficiency metrics. So they defined efficiency. Well, the chicken sold divided by the chicken cooked. Sounds pretty good. So the better you are at that, the better you are at making money for the company. Surveyed the company, went through, and for months, one unit had the highest chicken efficiency across the entire company. So they sent people out to audit it. They figured we could learn from this one and improve the efficiency of the whole company. Within the first day, they knew what they were doing, and they realized we shouldn't spread it around. The manager of that location said, to fix my metric, the biggest time I have chicken leftovers at the end of the day. So about two hours before the day ended to sell them fried chicken, they quit making chicken early, and they only made it to order. What the auditor found who was looking at it was in the last couple hours, they people come in and want chicken. The guys say, great, we'll have it for you. It will be about 15 minutes while we cook it up. And they said, we're not willing to wait 15 minutes. And they walked and went to another restaurant. So to optimize their efficiency, they choose to lose sales 
to make the primary goal there. I expect all of us would look at this and say that probably was a nice metric, but it was leading to wrong behaviors. Now, metrics are important, and they truly are. Good metrics lead to good work. What I see a lot right now is a lot of companies, well, the executives are saying, I need a dashboard. I need a balanced scorecard. They're seeing this, a lot of companies are speaking of the true benefits of it, and they really are beneficial. But when the goal is just to have a scorecard, is that going to lead to good behavior? Okay. You'd think this directive isn't too hard to put one together, is it? Well, I measure things, let's put them on the dashboard. But now let's think of what we saw in the last two examples. Can you pick metrics that you can measure, but they lead to the wrong behavior? Well, let's take a look at a couple. Well, we'll talk of the case everybody thinks about it. Enron is a company that, if you recall, collapsed. Looks like the screens aren't updating real fast here. I think you should see it now. Well, let's look at what happened at Enron. We know what they talk about at the end, but how could they get there? If you look at a moment, they had some practices that caused Enrons and some others to struggle and ultimately fail. One thing is the company adjusted their financial practices to make their quarterly goals and their gains look like they were maintained over time. Another thing is we find the executives manipulated their marketplace to keep revenues up. And lastly, they played around with their finances to make it look better than they really were. Now, when they did this, the understanding now is they looked at this as a gray area and not against the law. However, we've seen what happens. A number of them um, have gone to jail over it, but it's clearly been seen as unethical. Anderson Consulting that had worked with them, I think, ended up going out of business over this. Now, how could this all come about? Ask a question. Did all the unethical MBAs move to Enron so they can do this? Or did the culture at Enron and the metric-driven system drive them to be unethical? Most people think it was the culture that drove it, not the people. A lot of times in the Lean Six Sigma world, we look at a process, a Y, as a function of the X's or Y equals F of X. Propose what Enron did is what a lot of companies do all the time, is they pick their Y's, their outputs, and they manage them. And a lot of times when you manage a Y, all you can really do is how it's reported. If you don't deal with the X's or the things that drive the output, you're probably not doing the right behavior. In other words, your metric might be leading to bad behavior if you're just managing to the Y's. Another view of this, though, is that we see a lot of companies that have their executive pay that's tied to business performance. That seems to be a good thing, but can it lead to good behavior if that's the primary driver? Especially if your culture drives it, do everything right for the company. One study that we found talked about the only true correlated causal relationship to business driving the stock price up was whether projected earnings matched the Wall Street expectations. Think about it. Earnings matched an arbitrary choice by people on Wall Street. If that's true, stock price went up and the leadership ended up getting more money out of it. Good thing. But let's look at it in a hypothetical case. You're the executive. The finance organization gave you an initial report that you're going to miss your expectations. That means stock price will drop. A lot of these executives, short-term gains at the current stock price drives even continued employment. So if they allow this to happen, they may lose their job. They may lose income. What, cho what might they choose to do if their goal is to keep the stock price up? Would they do the ethical thing? I don't want to ask what you might do. But these same dilemmas happen in many organizations. You have to think about what they may lead to. Before I go on, I'd like to do another poll. This is about who's participating in this. We've got listed from the executive leadership, through practitioners, down to people that are just doing learning. Please indicate who you are. And I know if you have multiple people listening, you just get one choice, but pick one that's representative.
All right, we're about to close it out here. Please get your answers. Oh, looks like it's a lot of practitioners, but we've got the whole range again. I hope you're all getting a benefit out of this. Some executives. All right. I'll talk another little bit about metrics, and I have a couple questions we'll address. Next one's about traditional accounting. This comes out of a book called Real Numbers. It's a neat book. It was written by CFOs financial people in two companies that were doing lean deployments. So they had the lean aspects of it. They wrote some things that you could consider a little bit scary. First, and they said that information, they were talking about the financial part, but it means in all parts of the business. Over years, managers have learned to understand their performance, not in actual numbers, such as income or cost, but as variances to plan or goals. These variances, since they're related to arbitrary numbers have little relationship to what reality is. These same managers soon learn that you can adjust your variances up and down by adjusting the plan. In other words, if you were using labor hours to make a million pieces of plastic, you just got to make more, it makes your hours per part look better, even if it didn't help the business. A lot of this complex accounting, they consider like funhouse mirrors. You could make the skinny man look fat just by shifting your position. Now think about it. That's not a real good thought. A lot of us right now look at your business metrics or your organizational metrics, and you are doing percent of plan, percent of goal. I know in the last company I worked, I won't tell you who they are because it doesn't make them sound good, but the management found that the accounting department yelled at them if they spent faster than plan. So what they did is they just put in their plan to spend all their money in their department within the first quarter of the fiscal year, so they were always underspending. Now, of course, in the last month of each year, they overspent, but no one yelled at them all year. Now, they changed the goal to look good so they'd be left alone. We actually had a, probably a worst case on metrics with green, red, and yellow scorecards, which we're going to talk about soon that a company had two scorecards, the one they used and the one they showed their customer. They had different goals for the customer. Once they'd be all green, so no one would bother them. Now, it can lead to bad behavior. Next slide here is a set of metrics that came out of the city of Austin, which we're located in. This was their performance scorecard that they shared, saying we're going to be open about it. Again, it's a table of numbers. Almost every company you we deal with has some level of reporting by tables of numbers because Excel's very easy to put stuff together in. Let's look at the third line here. Cost per customer call at dispatch. What we see in these is generally you come up with a story to explain the numbers. Now these are yearly numbers. What do you tell about performance across one year? A lot happens in a year, and this is for the utility department. They could come up with a story that said, well, we expected to annex more land in 2002, so we staffed up, so the price per call went up. It didn't happen in time, because nothing does. But in 2003, now the acquisitions or the annexations are coming on, so the price is coming down. So you see it's not a problem. Could this be true? Well, yeah. Is it correlated or causal? A whole different question. So it's hard when you get tables of numbers. You sort of have to have a story with them to understand them. We propose that tables of numbers are not a good way to demonstrate metrics. Okay. Before I jump into all metrics, talk about the balanced scorecard. It's a very popular topic. It actually hasn't been around very long. This is the Kaplan and Norton process when they originally came out with it. They focused on you set your business and, and or your vision and strategy for your organization. From that, you drive Balanced metrics, financial customers, internal business, learning and growth. Where learning and growth was the workforce metrics. This was a balance, and they're right. You can't just pick one and drive your company by it. We can think of one that drove just on financials, which was an earlier example of Enron. They didn't think about the rest. They ended up causing a lot of pain for the employees when they went out of business, and they hurt their customers as they, man as they manipulated the marketplace. Another one that comes to mind, was Xerox. When they came out with the first photocopiers, 
everybody had them, but they had a bigger revenue source in the service contracts than they ever did making the copiers. Because their income was so great, they didn't improve quality. They stayed on the financials, didn't do what their customer wanted. You don't see very many Xerox copiers around right now. Again, the balance is very important. We propose, though, that picking your strategies and then setting metrics may not be the best way to go. We believe you should set your visions and your strategies based on your performance. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is going to be a series of slides that come out of a comprehensive balance scorecard or dashboard. It was a company that no longer puts it up on the Internet. We use it as an example to show what it's sometimes seen as a best practice, but I want you to read through it and see what you think. The paragraph in there is their vision mission statement. Does it look like anybody could have used this? And they're all pretty good. A couple of you may laugh that this could be mine. Minimum 20% profit, 60% of revenue with repeat customers. These are even quantitative metrics. What do you think about the one towards the bottom? I'm going to ensure all employees are competent and high performers. Would you like the metric to make sure all of your employees are competent? First of all, I don't know how you'd measure it, but the second one is how do you improve it? Tough one. All right, let's go to the next one. We'll have a couple slides here that talk about the metrics. If you look at them, there's a mixture. They're balanced. There's people metrics, financial metrics, production metrics, customer metrics, they're all in there. We look at it, there's some other issues with them. We'll look at two of them here, one of the line charts and one of the bar charts here. This is the customer satisfaction metric. Most companies, organizations have one. Look at it. First of all, what's the goal? 100%. Would you like that metric to be yours? 100% is awful hard to make all the time, so the best you can do is fail at a lower level. Now, if we look at this, it's also this month's reporting. The ask or the exclamation point indicates it's a problem, but what was it last month? What was it a year ago? These numbers might be bad if you've been at 100% for the last three months, but if you're at 10% satisfaction, these could be great. So again, Bar charts and Pareto's look neat for the moment, but they don't show performance over time. And really, performance does happen over time. Okay. The next one's a line chart. We're getting closer to what we'd like or what's a good best practice. But at least you can look over time here on this one. And profit's a good metric. Notice it's got a goal. Goal's at 20. But is this good or bad? Well, the exclamation point says it's bad or it needs improvement, but what you can't tell is what happened last year. This metric goes 1 through 12, probably months, indicating they only track their metrics over the fiscal year. Now that's a tough one. It's real nice at the beginning. If I can be doing very poorly on the last month of fiscal year and the company promises to reset my metric back to on target for the next month, realize performance crosses fiscal years. Do you really want your metrics to look at each year by itself? Realize that fiscal years are a system set up for the accounting and the reporting of your taxes and such. Performance in your customer view does not have a fiscal year. This type of reporting also led to what Krispy Kreme did a few years ago of businesses shipping more donuts every day to meet their production goals, knowing that they'd be returned because that was the deal they had with their outlets. Next one. Good and bad about metrics. We examine traditional metrics or what most organizations have. They're generally fiscal year for the financials because they're going against plan. There's no systematic approach to the selection of metrics to matching the strategies and the improvement efforts. And a lot of them just compare today against yesterday, this month against last month, this month against a year ago this month. Or they're just point estimate comparisons. Generally, they're just looking at the whys or the outputs, and they're not really considering the drivers of performance. A lot of them are short-term. They react to one data point that's 
changed or different. All of this together doesn't lead much to a how to improve or metrics that drive that purposely drive good behavior. Let's stop for a minute and answer a couple questions before we leave this slide. First we have is, can you summarize the attributes of an effective metric? I know there's some on the screen, and they're all good things. But generally they should address a business need and provide an honest assessment that everybody looks at and comes up with the same conclusion. A couple others, you can use the SMART idea, but let's focus on a couple. They should be actionable. I really believe that you shouldn't have a business metric that the business isn't committed to taking action if it changes. Why would you want one that when it changes, it's out of control or it goes to a different state, that everybody goes, we understand that, let's move on. Business metrics should be actionable. Here's another one. One of our participants wrote in, they're trying to initiate a type of improvement or tracking system like this, but the senior management only cares about the return on the investment. Well, how do you measure the return on the investment? That is hard sometimes, because what you're doing is leading to good behavior versus poor behavior. How do you judge the benefits to not doing something wrong? Those are very difficult actions. Um, if they're re looking at ROI or return on investment, that really is looking at a short-term gain. And it's not always short-term, but it's a very difficult thing. I think what you end up doing is you take these metrics or these systems and you talk about the new message or the outcome of them and try to talk about what's going to happen in the future, making best, better business sense. All right. Next one. I choose this to somewhat lead into our discussion of some better metrics. I don't want you to walk away thinking all we did is talk about the problems. Let's talk about some things you can do. Well, first of all, is all metrics aren't equal. We really look at there's metrics at different levels, satellite levels, 30,000 foot level metrics. You've probably used the altitude at decision to look at metrics because they're not all equal. In our view here, satellite level metrics, we're going to talk about the financials, what the shareholders care about, what the equity holders care about. That's really what the inter integrated enterprise excellence system focuses on is the complete output of the whole effort. Why well, have a business improvement system that doesn't drive those type of metrics? The issue with those, those are complete outputs that are the result of everything else you have going on in your whole business. There's no knob to change profit or revenue. You get those by doing the other things right. We call the 30,000 foot level metrics the ones that you make business decisions on. Those are the weekly and monthly performance metrics that your divisions and your leaders are making activities or decisions to change them with the expectation if you adjust those metrics in the right direction, the satellite level metrics get better. We do use the Lean Six Sigma model for the improvement plan, but we're going to talk to really using the DMAIC process the enterprise level, not just in projects. Let's look at something we call a value chain. It drives you to understand what good metrics are. It's generally a functional process map, and that's you probably can't read the graphic, but that's the middle of the one on the upper right. The oval things are metrics that drive off the functions. We believe that you pick 30,000 foot level metrics for every business function you have, not based on the organization chart, not based on strategies, they're based on performance of the functions you need to do to perform your business. And this isn't a value stream map because you've got to put things in there that you need to do to stay in business, not just ones that provide customer value. The one on the far end that you can't read is their satellite metrics or financial reporting because that's the purpose of the entire business function. What you do is you take these metrics, which are functional performance metrics, where they're not performing the function adequately, it drives you to put together business strategies at this point to improve functional performance. No strategies come after performance measurement. Let's talk about firefighting. It was the third bullet we talked about. We're going to come back to scorecards one more time. What is firefighting? In a statistical term, it's treating a common cause is a special cause. 
But what does it really mean? It means reacting to something that there's a reason it happened when it really was just part of the random or the regular process. This really takes an awful lot of time in most organizations. You can probably relate to it. The top management can probably relate to it. But a lot of the issues that we're talking about here is why some of the leadership in organizations got promoted because they were good at firefighting. Boy, when you get involved with one, it's fun. You get an adrenaline rush. You get to make rapid decisions. These best firefighters are getting rewards and promoted. The problem is they don't reward the fire prevention team quite as well. And a lot of what we're talking about here is fire prevention. So let's go back and look at scorecards again, because uh, that leads to the firefighting. This scorecard was actually pulled from a cause. One of the students that works with us shared it. It's their business scorecard. Again, we took all the words off that are proprietary. What we have here is an Excel sheet with colors that change based on your attainment of a goal. There's customer, there's dollar metrics, there's internal, and there's people metrics, a very good balance. What do you see in it generally? Well, lots of color. There's reds, yellows, and greens. And if you look at one, a couple of them there, it goes green, red, red, green, red. Now, if this is a good performance issue and it's consistent, how can it go from really good to really bad in a period of a month? And these are monthly numbers. One thing it is, is it's also, when you look at this, it's sort of hard to see. There's a lot of metrics. That is a problem. Generally, research says that in a scorecard or a dashboard, a single person can't monitor more than seven to ten metrics at any one time. If you've got more than that, chances are you're not giving them their due time and oversight. All right. Another one before we leave is there's a couple there. How can a performance metric that's important be read the entire year? or month to month. Either it really isn't that bad, or you're living with it, or you're at risk of even continued business existence. So we got to consider that is an issue with red, yellow, greens also. Let's look at one of these specifically. It's labeled as financial metric B, and it's expanded at the bottom. Look at the numbers. The goals, yellow and green criteria right below the scores. Notice it went red, two greens, a yellow. All right. If we look at this, 33% or a third of the days are red, meaning I need corrective actions to explain why that period did not perform. Well, half of them are green, which someone's getting thanked for it. Can a process really do that? So we're going to go look at this, these values, and what we're going to consider the IEEE method, or what we propose might be a better way to look at performance metrics. I'll admit it's not as simple and pretty as a red, yellow, green scorecard because we do propose a little less metrics that the metrics are actually better and more actionable. All right, let's look at it a different way. What we have is that same scorecard at the top, but we're going to turn those numbers around and ask, is it consistent? We're going to do this with an individual's chart. Now, if you haven't done SPC or Six Sigma work, you probably have seen one, but in a simple sense, it's a chart with the numbers over time that limits are drawn on it that relate to the variation in the process. If a data point crosses outside of those control limits, it's considered unpredictable or unstable. What's interesting at the 30,000 foot level, almost everything is routine and predictable unless you make a change. So these metrics here, although it went red and green, if you look at that time chart, even if you don't understand control charts, it looks consistent. We will call that predictable. If I don't do anything, I predict I'll get the same performance over time. Looks that way, doesn't it? So that's predictable. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to talk about now that it's predictable, what's the next thing you want to do? Answer, what would you predict? Now, if we have a goal from this red, yellow, green scorecard of being better than less than 2.2, all right, smaller is better. Now, if I look at this, I can take it to a probability plot. You may not be used to it, but it's just a statistical tool that helps you understand the percentages or probabilities. And I get this says 32.6, or about a third of the time, I will meet my goal of 2.2 and be below it. So if it's predictable and a third of the time I'm going to meet my goal, why should I react 
if I'm above it, if it's predictable, and that's really what we're leading. We would take those two, and since most businesses don't necessarily care about the tools you get there, they care about the business decision, at the bottom we net it out to say, financial metric B is a predictable process with about one-third of the performance below our goal. So if we continue with our current business practices, we will continue to get that performance. Now that's a lot different than saying, I'm red five days and green six days, I mean months. But it's more actual. It lets you treat this differently. If you looked at this, now if you're a practitioner, where'd you go after to improve this? Well, surely chasing after the red days for a predictable process is not going to lead you to find anything. This is a common cause for a consistent problem that we have to change. You can't chase red points. We talk about it in some other terms. The control limits are the on the middle left. Those are considered the voice of the process. The data is telling me that that's how much variation exists. It's not the voice of the customer. It leads to a common question we see that says, I don't like to use control charts or individual's charts because the limits are too wide. What can I do to tighten down the limits on my control chart? Well, the problem comes up, the voice of the process drives the limits. You can't just tighten them down. Generally, when we hear that, that means my process is good enough, but it's consistent. Now, I'm going to tighten the specs on it to gain better performance. Well, most of us at this point know that doesn't work very well. So what you have to do is reduce the variation. And that's what a lot of these great tools out there are about. It's not root cause analysis. It's a detailed look to reduce the variation in your process. Now, the IWE system we've been talking about helps you confront the hazards that are in front of you for this whole issue. There's a lot of competition. The global economy makes us change. We're competing against people we never competed before. Line managers and supervisors now have to make business decisions that are significant. You have to get them information that they can make the right decision so it doesn't have to roll up to the leadership every time. In short, we need an enterprise system to manage our business performance so everybody can work to driving the right behavior. The Integrated Enterprise Excellence System is really a bunch of other systems that have been successful over the years rolled up and wrapped up around a business enterprise focus rather than a project only focus. If you've been in this business long, you've seen a lot of these. Each of them had some really good benefits to these tools, but you take the best of each, come up with an efficient system, and we're called, we treat that as the enterprise and excuse me, the Integrated Enterprise Excellence System, documented in a series of books now. What it really talks about is using high-level business metrics and having a tier by altitude to lead you to make a decision on the right improvement projects and then using the Lean Six Sigma Theory constraints and all the improvement tools and a system to make the improvement that will then tie back to high enterprise improvements. Why do an improvement effort that doesn't change the bottom line probability of success of your business or enterprise? Now a graphic that talks about something I said earlier. Using the DMAIC or the Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control idea, which a lot of us learned for Six Sigma, use it at the enterprise level to drive business improvement leadership. We call it the Enterprise DMAIC or eDMAIC. But you can see from the graphic here that you define your business, you understand your functional metrics. You rank them from satellite to 30,000 foot and maybe lower. You take the earlier reporting methods and look at the control charts and probabilities and see, is this going to last forever? Is it momentary? I analyze all that to find where my biggest risk for continued enterprise success, and that's the improve phase where you drive to a project. How do you improve? Sometimes it's design, redesign something. Sometimes it's fundamentally improve it. But again, we've used the DMAIC role to drive the improvement projects that best support enterprise success. Now, when you get to run in a project, and we do believe projects are important, but only where you need them. You don't run projects on small things when you can just go do it 
you also don't just go do it when it's really a complex issue. So generally start out, you get your data. You find the baseline. Is it predictable if it is? You go look at the performance of the distribution. So we go take it to get long-term performance. You don't count the data, you count the distribution that generated it. You compare it to the voice of the customer or the requirements. Those lack of meeting the requirements drives you to run an improvement project. That improvement project hopefully makes an improvement. Then you would go back and look at your process post-improvement, the same method. Now, if smaller is better, you're on your way. But you're going to now, it is consistent, predictable. Now, what do I predict? You use the same rules to predict future performance of meeting the customer needs. The difference between these two drives the value of your improvement. Now, you can do it by money or really any currency of value in a business can drive the benefits of these programs. All right. That was simple. You could say I just covered a Lean Six Sigma course in there, but there's really a lot more to that. So what could you do next? If you like these ideas, you want to learn more about them, you have a couple options. There's, a, there's books that we offer that highlight this whole concept. This advanced, we consider it an enhanced methodology to improve business or improvement and efficiency. It's full of best practices and a lot of tools that you can use today. It includes in it a no-nonsense roadmap for this e -demaic. how you can go put it together and use it to drive projects along with it. There's a roadmap for doing project work to make the improvements. So there's four main books. A paperback that's really easy that puts together the case for action of the burning platform or why we need to go make these differences. And then three hardback volumes that really are resource or reference books to help you go do this. There are articles on our website that you can download that talk about many aspects of this, from the project level use of tools to the enterprise view of good metrics. A lot of things you can do. You can also write us or call us. We will contact you if you don't otherwise mark it at the end of the survey. Let's take a couple general questions that are left over, because that's the heart of the material I wanted to talk about. You get a quick chance if you want to type one in, but I have a couple here. Um, let's see. How do you get upper management buy-in? Many of us got feelings for what's right, but it's hard to do a bottoms-up deployment of an improvement effort. It really is. I've been on both sides of them from when the leadership pushes it and the workforce pushes it. And I'll tell you, it's easier if the leadership wants it. But how do you do it? Many of us have been trained in a couple things we can give you advice. Don't push the tools. Push the business game. Push the result. Talk about what you can give, do. Don't give them what they don't want. Give them a second view of what can be seen. But a lot of this, how do you even get access to them? A couple thoughts as talk with your peers and understand your group. Figure out who are the influential people to the executives. Target them. Find people know them. Generally, they are more approachable. Talk about what you think the business can gain. But again, talk about the results or the gain or the benefits. Don't talk about the tools. And let them take you to the executive level. This can work if you're finding leading thinking people that are willing to listen. This is especially hard to do in companies that are doing well. Somehow it's easier to talk to the executives about improvement when things are bad. But one thing I'll say is do what's right. Don't give up. Don't tell anybody they're wrong. Just keep giving better options. It is slow, but it works if you keep at it. Another one here. What's the success factor for this? Is there anything you're required to get things going? Not really. I think it's slow and methodical. The beauty of most improvement programs and this IEEE or Integrated Enterprise Excellence is you don't have to do a pervasive all company-wide or a full-court press. These tools can work at any profit and loss center, any business unit, but really at some level it has to be something that can segment itself in your financial system, which even could be a project or a product line. Sometimes you need to do it as if it's a pilot test to get your 
recognition, and pilot tests are a very powerful thing to get this done. I did get a quant, and this is someone who took my advantage of sneaking one question in here right at the end, but they ask about recommended first books. Now, in my nature, I can't just answer a simple question, but there's four books we talk about, and you can find them on our website, and I believe they're also on Amazon. But the first book for what? If your first book is how to do a problem-solving effort and run a project, Volume 3 is really about solving projects. If your goal is to look at this enterprise stuff, our Volume 2 book is really about the enterprise domain. But this is also first books if you've already got a feeling for it. You've got an insight in the improvement efforts. Really the, the first paperback is a good book if you're just interested and want to see if this is for you. So there's three probably first books. The one I didn't talk about to be complete is the Volume 1 book, which is really it's a lot like the goal. It's about trying to understand the whole improvement concepts outside of business. I hope that answers the question some. I think we're wrapping up here. We will offer you, since, and, and honestly, that really wasn't a canned question about which books are first, but we are offering you a chance to get a discount on these books if you want to order them over our website. There's a code now. I'll give you a second to write it down. Um, but if you want, you can get the series of books at a discount if you're interested in them. All right. Let's wrap it up. So we're getting close to our time. We covered a couple things. Scorecards and performance reporting. Metrics, good behavior and poor behavior. I hope I gave you a feeling for how some metrics can lead to good and some can lead to poor behavior. A lot about scorecards, balanced scorecards, red, yellow, and green, and how scorecards can lead to firefighting. Lastly, we tried to wrap up, because I don't want to just leave you that it's a bad time, but talk about things you can do as we talked about, the Integrated Enterprise Excellence System is a possible way to improve on all these aspects. Like everything that's good, they're not necessarily easy, but we hope you enjoyed it. Hope you all learned something. Now, again, as you exit the webinar, you'll be given a survey that will pop up on your screen. Please answer the questions. It helps us improve what we're doing. It's also one of our metrics that we're trying to track. Thank you very much for your time and appreciate it. I enjoyed giving this. Thank you.